Hello and welcome to The View From 22. My name is Max Jeffrey and I'm The Spectator's online commissioning editor. Why are tech giants so interested in philosophy? Are people today more moral than they were before? And why is Elon Musk backing Donald Trump? I'm joined today by Peter Singer, who's the world's most influential and perhaps the world's most interesting living philosopher, for a very discussion about morality in the 21st century. Peter was formerly a professor at Princeton University and he now is trying to reach a different audience with his new podcast, Lives Well Lived. Peter, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. You're described as a moral philosopher. So first, do you think that we're living in a particularly moral time? Do you think that people today are particularly notably interested in morality? Well, I don't know that we're more moral than other times, but we have larger, more global problems that... Um, I think people have taken an interest in, whereas previously perhaps morality was more limited to the local community uh, and not uh, focused on global issues, certainly not that much focused on issues beyond our own species. So that's another change. Uh, so I, I think there's a sense in which you could say we have a wider moral circle of concern, um, but whether that actually makes us more moral in our behaviour is is debatable question. Why do you think that that is? Why do you think we're more interested in moral concern today than previously? I think the reason for that is that we have a greater awareness of the rest of the world around us. Previously, we really were very much locked into our own community. We didn't know what was going on in distant places, or even if we did eventually find out, uh, it might take months for the news to get there. And of course, more months for us to be able to do anything about the situation. Uh, if we even could, whereas now we have um, instant communication worldwide um, and very rapid responses to things that are happening. So I think it's just given us this greater sense of being a part of a global community, um, not as much as I would like to see, but still a lot more than was possible in earlier centuries. Something, Peter, that's interested me are the kind of morals and philosophies of the ultra-rich. Um, people like Elon Musk or Peter Thiel, Jeff Bezos. Um, I think it's something that's perhaps in people's minds quite a bit at the moment. We've had kind of a wave of endorsements for Donald Trump in the last week or so. Um, and viewers may have themselves seen the recent conversation between Elon Musk and Jordan Peterson that happened this week. I wonder if your work on effective altruism is kind of a good way into this discussion. Um, this was your philosophy or worldview that became popular um, sometimes among a lot of the ultra-rich, but also among ordinary people. Could you start perhaps by outlining what effective altruism is? Certainly. Um, effective altruism is both a, a way of living, a, a philosophy of life, if you want, um, a, a, but also it's become a social movement. Um, so the philosophy of life is that at least one of our aims in life not necessarily the sole aim or perhaps not even the dominant aim, but an important part of our life ought to be to make the world a better place, to contribute to leaving things better than they would have been if we had not been here at all, to have some sort of positive impact on the world. That's the altruism part. The effective part is to draw on evidence and reasoning to work out how you can do the most good that you can with whatever resources you have available for doing good, which might be money, might be time that you can put into it and volunteer, uh, might be particular skills. But uh, whereas it's fairly obvious when we are buying things that we want to get the best value for money, when we're being altruistic, particularly, let's say, if we're donating to charities, it's not at all obvious to many people that we should try to get the best value for our donation. Um, people do very little, often no research into how do you get the best value for what you're putting into a, into a charity, which, which charities give you more bang for your buck than others. So that's put those two things together and you get effective altruism. And as I said, as well as that set of ideas, we have now a, uh, an international community of people who talk about that online, who discuss the best things to do, how to live, um, and essentially bring those ideas to a, a wider range of people so that it's, it's starting to be significant in terms of the sums of, of money and the time and the skills and the thought 
that it moves towards different ways of making the world a better place than it would otherwise have been. Yeah, Peter, I think um, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I think perhaps in the last five years or so, effective altruism has really um, taken off. What do you, can you kind of tell that story of what it was like at the beginning and versus what it is now? How did it pick up into such a big, such a serious social movement? Well, I mean, my original contribution goes right back to the 1970s when I wrote an article called Famine, Affluence and Morality, in which I argued that for people who are living in affluent societies and were not really at the bottom of those societies, but were middle class or above, we ought to be doing a lot more to help people in extreme poverty, people suffering from, from famines, for instance. Uh, and that article got anthologized in those anthologies that philosophy students use when they do uh, practical ethics courses. So quite a lot of students of philosophy read them, but nothing very dramatic happened um, until the early 2000s when uh, a group of people, really I think beginning at Oxford University, um, started thinking, well, you know, yes, these ideas are right. Um, we know they're right, but a lot of people have been saying they're right without doing anything about them. Um, and we ought to try to do something about them. And in particular, and this was the important addition, we ought to try and find out how you can best help people in extreme poverty. Um, so people like Toby Ord and, and Will McCaskill at, at Oxford started thinking about this. Um, uh, Toby in particular did some uh, research into where he could get the best value for, the, for what he was giving. And, and he was pretty surprised to discover that even just comparing a sort of average charity to one of the best charities. So I'm not talking about comparing fraudulent charities, but just an average charity to one of the best. The best might do not just 10 times as much good, but perhaps hundreds of times as much good because it was picking targets that were much more low cost for the benefit. Uh, and Realising that, he decided, well, pe more people should know about this. And he started uh, an organisation called Giving What We Can to tell people more about this. And I date the whole movement as starting there in about 2008, 2009. Um, so it's a relatively young movement and then growing quite rapidly over the next uh, 10 or 15 years. Sorry to interrupt the show, but if you enjoy what we do here at Spectator TV, then why not subscribe to the magazine as well? If you subscribe today, you get 12 weeks for just £12, plus a free £20 John Lewis and Waitrose gift card. You can sign up at spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. Mm. And as you said in your previous answer, Peter, it's, the movement is spoken about online. There's forums dedicated to it. Um, it's on spoken about on social media, Twitter in particular. Um, it seems to me that it's um, of particular interest to people who are in tech, in artificial intelligence, in science. Why do you think that is? I think it's the quantitative mindset um, that uh, is more open to this idea. You know, to them, uh, it, it's obvious. You know, if if for a given donation, whatever it is you can give, you can get a hundred times as much good. Um, it's just obvious to them that that's what you ought to do, and that it would really be a bad mistake to give to the organisation that can do only one percent of the good. Uh, with the resources that you have. So, so they latch onto that very quickly. Um, and I think that's the type who are in tech. And of course, also, the other factor is that huge fortunes have been made by people in tech, often people who are quite young um, and who never expected to have that amount of money. And you don't really know what to do with it, in a sense. I mean, I don't want to just accumulate money for its own sake. Uh, so um, they do think about giving away substantial amounts of it. Uh, and this is then the movement that they go to. So we're going to give this money away, but where will we give it to? So they get into those discussions. Effective altruism um, made the news and probably came most into public consciousness through what happened with Sam Bankman-Fried. Um, I think you've said before that what happened with him, which is, and for viewers who don't know, he started a cryptocurrency exchange, um, which then kind of went bust. He called himself an effective altruist. And people use that as an opportunity to kind of sully the entire movement. Um, what did you make of that? And do you think that it showed any flaws in the ideology at all? Well, it certainly showed flaws in what Sam Bankman-Fried was doing. Um, but I don't think it 
showed flaws in the ideas of effective altruism as such. Um, you know, in, in any human activity that has um, you know, hundreds of thousands or perhaps millions of people involved, you'll get some who do something wrong. Um, it's just so happened in the effective altruism movement that because Sam Bankman Fried had made so much money from that crypto exchange you mentioned um, and was featured on the cover of magazines as, you know, the latest whiz kid, and he was actually the richest person under 30 in the world uh, at one time. Uh, so, so he became a kind of symbol or pin-up uh, person for the effective altruism movement. And then when it emerged that he had used clients' funds to prop up his own um, sort of investment vehicle. Uh, you know, obviously, that was a blow to effective altruism. And a lot of people said, well, you know, they're all hypocrites or they're just pretending to be effective altruists. Um, but clearly, that's not true. Um, it, even whether that's true of Sam Bankman Fried is, is something that you can discuss. Um, uh, perhaps one of the best books um, on him is by Michael Lewis's book, Going Infinite. And um, I think Lewis accepts that he was actually genuine, although he certainly messed up very badly, um, that he was genuine in thinking that he was going to use his vast fortune to do good. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's a blow. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for him. Um, it's a tragedy for the clients who lost money, um, although most of them now actually, interestingly, have, have got paid back. Um, but um, it's a tragedy for the fact that that fortune evaporated and can, was no longer there to do the good things that it might have done. So, uh, but but does it affect the movement as a whole? I would I would say no. I think I think we've we've moved on from Sam Bankman Fried. Um, uh, we realise that people are fallible. We perhaps want to be a bit more cautious about assuming that billionaires um, are going to be able to deliver on on what they're giving. And certainly the billionaires themselves, I think, need to think more about following just the basic rules of, of honest dealing. But, um, but I don't think it's, it's really a long-term blow to uh, the effective altruist movement. Peter, since effective altruism got so much publicity, we've seen a growth in other kinds of worldviews that are tangential to it. Things like techno-optimism, effective accelerationism. What do you make of these movements and why do you think they followed what happened with effective altruism? Well, I mean, I think they they followed from the, some of the topics that effective altruists took up, in particular, uh, taking a, a long-termist view. Um, as I've said, I think effective altruism got started um, with the idea of helping people in extreme poverty, uh, and there's certainly plenty to do there. But some people started thinking about risks to the survival of our species. Um, the, the risk that I grew up with was nuclear war during the Cold War era in particular. Um, we were all very worried about extinction of our species through an exchange of, of nuclear weapons between the Soviet Union and the United States in particular. Um, so that's clearly one of them. But some of the long-termists thought also that the growth of artificial intelligence was a major threat that it could take over, you know, super intelligence could take over and maybe decide that we're a nuisance and get rid of us. Uh, and then there's things like asteroid collision, uh, uh, bioterrorism, engineering, deadly viruses. So there's a lot of possible risks. And some effective altruists thought, well, that would mean that the future lives of people who otherwise would exist um, they won't be there. You know, if we become extinct sometime this century, then how, you know, it's hard to say, but vast numbers of human beings who would have existed for maybe millions of years and perhaps would have colonized other planets eventually and spread throughout the galaxy, um, that they won't exist. And so that led people to thinking more about some of these technological questions as to, well, how can we prevent or reduce these extinction risks? Um, but they also question, you know, is the future really going to be so good, right? Because part of this sense of what a terrible loss it would be if we don't survive is the idea that because of technology, if we do survive, we will learn how to feed everybody, how to provide for good quality of life for everyone. Um, 
and a lot of the causes of strife um, that exist now will not will not be there. So there was a kind of a there's a, a built-in optimism to this view that our lives are going to get better and better. Uh, and that's something that um, a lot of people, again, in the tech industry are enthusiastic about. They, they do think that these technologies, uh, and especially AI, hold the solution to lots of problems while also having some risks. Um, but that can be questioned. Um, uh, on the podcast I, I run called Lives Well Lived, recently had a conversation with Tyler Cowan. And um, he's not such an optimist because he thinks that human nature is basically going to be there still and that uh, uh, there will still be conflict and strife and struggle for power um, and that w- that will go on even if we can provide for everybody's material wants. So I think there is a real debate to be had there about how much of a positive impact technology is going to have. And it, it, you know, yes, it may have a, a positive impact, but, but will it really change things to a, what some people would see as a, a utopian future? Mm. Peter Singer, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Max. It's been great talking to you.